This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We have come together with members of the Faculty of Religious Education to continue our discussions of the standard works. This session we want to talk about the premortal stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have with us today, beginning on my far left, Professor Brent L. Topp, Professor of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University, Professor Camille Franck, Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU, Professor Paul Hoskison, also Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU. And I'm Andrew Skinner, also of the Department of Ancient Scripture. Last time we met, we had a rousing discussion, I thought, of the, of the significance of the four Gospels. And uh, I think this session, we, it would be well to take a look at the premortal stature of the Lord so that we can try to fully understand what it is that the Gospels are telling us about this being who came to earth as, as a mortal. And I th honestly do think, I've thought about this, that aside from the discussions of the Savior's atoning sacrifice, some of the most powerful statements that we have in Scripture tell us about the premortal stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd like to begin our discussion, if you wouldn't mind, by taking us forward to a personal testimony that the Lord gave to the Prophet Joseph Smith in section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and maybe use this as a springboard for the rest of our discussion this session. Uh, section 93 is just one of those powerhouse sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, and uh, this is a pretty significant statement, uh, not just for Latter-day Saints, but really for the entire Christian world. Section 93, verse 21. And now verily I say unto you, I was in the beginning with the Father, and am the firstborn. So I'll throw that out, ask you to comment on that, elaborate on it, and then we'll move forward from there. What's the Savior telling us in this very personal statement to the Prophet Joseph? Well, in the premortal existence uh, of all of the spirit children that were born to our our father and our mother in the in that world, Jesus Christ was the firstborn, and therefore uh, occupied uh, a position which uh, gave him the right and the, and the privilege, uh, because of that, to uh, uh, be the Son of God and to become the Savior for the world. Elder McConkie calls it the eternal birthright. And as we know from Old Testament, birthright was not just a, a status, it was a responsibility associated with it. And so the birth order was one aspect of it, but I think the word firstborn there takes on new significance when we think of first as not just sequence or chronology, but also preeminence. Preeminent status, yes. absolutely. <clears throat> Let me just pick up for a minute on this concept of birthright that we come across in the Old Testament. It seems to me pretty clearly after reading this that the concept of the birthright in the Old Testament really is a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. It yeah, points type. pretty clearly. It's a type and a shadow of Him. What did the firstborn, what did the birthright in Old Testament times entail? Oh, that's that wonderful little passage in the first chapter of Abraham where Abraham desired to have that same right. And the explanation with it, um, Abraham 1, end of verse 4. Um, it came down from the fathers from the beginning of time, yea, even the beginning, or before the foundation of the earth, down to the present time, even the right of the firstborn, or the, right, or the first man who was Adam, or the first father through the fathers unto me. Yeah. There seems to be, it's, it comes from Christ, but then it gets its name through Adam. And for all those that were considered patriarchs or those that... that 
directed the affairs of God on the earth. The, the leadership. The of leadership. Heaven, yeah, the leadership the of the family. And, and one step further than leadership, I think we misunderstand birthright a little bit when we think of the birthright, that the birthright son of the Old Testament got a double portion, but they, we don't go far enough to remember that part of that double portion was to care for the rest of the family. It's, it's a birthright not of privilege so much as it is obligation and opportunity to serve the rest of the family, so, yeah, to redeem that, them. Yeah, redeem and I think, them. That, I think that word in caring for the family or redeeming the family is surely uh, Christ in typology yeah, there. What's, what's meant and by And the Lord by seems to go out of his way to show that it is not birth order that's the important thing as you think of most of those more, that we know yeah, about often are, not. That's right. are yes. later. It's that preeminent mm -hmm. status. Abraham, uh, Moses, uh, Joseph, none of those were the Nephi. first born. Yes. Nephi. Right. And yet it was because of their worthiness and their integrity and their right. faithfulness that they received the blessing of, uh, of the firstborn, not the literal yeah. firstborn in, in birth yeah. sequence, but of carrying that uh, obligation and that duty uh, to be a savior and a, and a blessing to their generation. Absolutely. You know, you ask the question, what is it he's saying in verse 21 of section 93? We've identified firstborn and what firstborn means, but I think if we go over to verse 7, I think that tells us something else uh, that adds to the meaning where, where he says, I saw his glory, the word glory there, Important. that he was in the beginning before the world was. It's not just that he existed before the world was. We all existed before the world was. That key word there, glory, and the role of we've already talked about of firstborn is beginning to tell us that that, that phrase in the book of Abraham where it says that there was one more intelligent than all the others and who was like unto God. The, the firstborn then takes on newer meaning, more profound significance than just the first spirit offspring of our heavenly parents. And that phraseology may confuse some people. We're not saying that, that in uh, pre-mortal councils he was a little bit like God. We're really saying that he was God. Elder McConkie says it very, very well in that he says he was like God, like unto God in all ways except for an exalted, tangible, resurrected body. Uh, which, of course, means that he was not. The, the only way, I guess, that, that he, uh, practically speaking, that he was different then is that, is that he was not the creator of our spirit Correct. bodies, our, our heavenly parents were. Now, I'm so glad that you mentioned this word glory because now we can go back um, 1,800 years to, the save, again, the Savior's personal testimony uh, that's recorded by John in which he's praying to his Father in heaven. This is the great intercessory prayer, prayer the great high priestly prayer recorded in John chapter 17 in which he himself makes reference to the glory that he had with a separate Father in heaven. This, this, these are not, you know, two in one. Brent, do you have that? Can you yeah, I've got that, that in verse 5. Uh, he says, And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So he is a glorified uh, personage of spirit. He is God. And one of his uh, uh, obligations as that firstborn and, and savior is to pass that same glory on, as he says in verse 22 of that chapter, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, the apostles, and that they may be one even as we are one. Right. You know, and in fact, I've always find that interesting, that that word glory, that I think sometimes we misunderstand the war in heaven and Lucifer's uh, proposal, if you will, that we think that it was all about glory. Well, the Savior himself is saying, I'm going to have, give me the glory that I had before, give us the glory that we can have. So it's really saying something much different. Uh, Lucifer is advocating something much different than glory. And glory that he is giving to us is to be like our Heavenly Father. Yes. Yeah. Um, think of what this means now when we read the New Testament. We're talking about a glorified personage of spirit. We're talking about God. And the four Gospels are describing the conditions under which he came to earth to be a mortal being, to to stub his toes, to bruise his shins, to learn how to walk, to talk, and all of those kinds of things. It really is a great condescension. Exactly. And, and this is the, 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 one of the significant, I guess, 
understated messages of the four Gospels is that God condescended to come and be man and enter, literally, to enter history as a mortal being. Well, you know, I think we sometimes forget that, uh, and, and yet, remember, Abinadi teaches so profoundly as well uh, before wicked King Noah, where we read there in, in uh, Mosiah chapters 13 through 15, where he says, God himself shall come down and redeem his people. He doesn't just say the Son of God or a potential Savior. No. He says the God of heavens is going to come down. That's exactly and, right. And, and I, I think that's why it's very, very important as we, we look at the New Testament, but in all of the standard works, we're looking at Jesus Christ as truly the way Isaiah prophesied, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God, God with, with us. us. And so the New Testament is showing us a pre-mortal God. We read it right there in John chapter 17 and elsewhere we're going to see that. We see a mortal God among us and we see a resurrected, exalted God after the resurrection. Oh, that's, that's a nice description. And, uh, and uh, I think Nephi's comment on this concept is very important too in 1 Nephi 11 where, where the uh, He's asked this question by the heavenly messenger that's talking with him, Knowest thou the condescension of God? And Nephi answers, I know that he loveth his children, nevertheless I do not know the meaning of all things. I'm not certain that we really can comprehend the condescension of God, this, the, the premortal Savior in his glory coming down to the earth as he did. Yeah, it's almost like we can talk about it and we can talk around it, but to to grasp the, the true significance That's of that is just staggering. The words of the hymn that we sing at Christmas time, the hopes and fears of all the years yeah. are met in thee tonight. I think of not only those of us who had not yet come to the earth and saw the hope of any future in him, but those who had come on the earth already and lived their life and seen to see that it is not a, the perfect life that they had maybe hoped. He is it, the really, answer. It, it is true. I, I'm so glad that Brother Hoskison pointed that out to us. It is staggering to think that God came to earth to become like us, to show us the way. In fact, I think if, uh, in light of what we've already talked about with the firstborn, and we could talk about the different dimensions of what that Godship entailed. We know that he, he wasn't the father of our spirits because he didn't have an exalted, resurrected body yet. Uh, but I think as we, we particularly as Latter-day Saints with modern revelation, get a glimpse of who this pre-mortal God was when we understand the war in heaven and the concept there. And we see from modern revelation that when the father said, whom shall I send? Uh, I, don't, I think we sometimes misunderstand that or misportray it. I don't think that it, the father is <laughs> saying nominations are now open for savior and that anybody could apply. That's right. uh, Elder Orson F. Whitney in the epic poem entitled Elias gives a beautiful portrayal that he said in poetic form that when the father asked whom shall I send, all eyes fell on one. Mm. And that when we speak of that pre-mortal God and that when he said, here am I, send me, we all understood the reason why he was the one. I love that imagery. Our eyes became riveted mm -hmm. on the and only he said, one all that eyes could expectantly fell on that one person, the only person that could do it. And I think that is why, in, as we talk about the premortal Godship of Jesus Christ, we then begin to understand what Lucifer is proposing because he couldn't be the Savior. That's exactly right. He couldn't do what And, and when he comes to do. Adam and Eve, uh, he is promising things that only God can Could promise, deliver. and that's why he is the big-time liar, because right. yeah. he can't deliver. <laughs> but what is also provided by this father asking the question, whom shall I send? It isn't a mystery to him at all. It gives the, uh, it, we all see that the Savior voluntarily right. takes this upon And we him. have an obligation. I, I, I right. have a little kind of a cutesy way of saying it with my students. I say it was a call for our common consent, not a request for resumes. Yeah. And, and so he voluntarily, lovingly, mm -hmm. willingly submitted, as he will later in Gethsemane and Golgotha, to that which was rightfully and only his, and we consent to it because we knew that's the only way it could be done. Yes. Now, now think of a, another aspect of his stature, one who is, who is volunteering to come down and be come a mortal, and yet this is a God who has been involved in creation. Mm -hmm. In fact, let's turn to the testimony of modern scripture, modern revelation, in the book of Moses, um, 
chapter one in the Pearl of Great Price. And uh, let's start with, um, with verses 31, 32, and 33. This to me is, an, is another indication of the greatness of the being that came to earth as a mortal and thus another indication of the condescension that we're talking about. Verse 31, And behold, the glory of the Lord was upon Moses, so that Moses stood in the presence of God and talked with him face to face. And the Lord God said unto Moses, For mine own purpose have I made these things. Here is wisdom, and it remaineth in me. And by the word of my power have I created them, which is mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth. And worlds without number have I created, all, and also I created them for mine own purpose, and by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. You want to talk about staggering power. You want to talk about... Uh, about uh, incomprehensible greatness, this is an experienced creator that volunteered to come down and become our Savior. Well, Paul teaches it throughout the New Testament. We find it on several occasions in the epistles where he teaches that Christ is the creator. And, and I think you begin to see that without modern revelation, without a, a correct understanding of a pre-mortal world, the, the conditions of the pre-mortal world, and, and the, the true nature of the Godhead, it would begin to, it would begin to be understandable why we would equate Christ with the Father and, and bring yeah. the Trinity view into it because without all of that other additional information and the scriptures clearly are teaching us that God himself will come among us, you can begin to see why you would view that way. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I, wanna, I wanna, just want to follow up on, on another question. What's the so what? So, so that Jesus is an experienced creator and so we understand that. What are the ramifications of us saying that? That he, he, that he created worlds without number. He not only creates them, but he also... Redeems them. The Savior redeems all that he creates. And in another place in Moses, it says that we're talking about millions and millions of earths like this one. He's the redeemer of them, just as he's the redeemer of this earth. Oh, I think, just can I read a part of Please. verse 35? Because I think that is so powerful in the midst of that verse. For behold, there are many worlds that have passed away by the word of my power, and there are many that now stand. And they are innumerable unto man, but all things are numbered unto me. I think to see that there is some of this process that has been completed by the word of his power, that, that there's redemption and there is creation. Yeah. He's the creator and the redeemer. Can I just share one of my very favorite quotes? This is from uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie. This was taken from his book, Mormon Doctrine. Quote, Now our Lord's jurisdiction and power extend far beyond the limits of this one small earth on which we dwell. He is under the Father, the creator of worlds without number. And through the power of his atonement, the inhabitants of these worlds, the Revelation says, are begotten sons and daughters unto God, Doctrine and Covenants, section 76, verse 24, which means that the atonement of Christ, being literally and truly infinite, applies to an infinite number of earths. That's pretty powerful. You know, Camille just brought up a really good point there uh, that I think links not only his role as creator with the role of redeemer, and that is where it looks there, where in verse 35 we just read, where it says that, that his creations are innumerable, yet I know them. That when we speak of the atonement as infinite and eternal, yet it is deeply personal and individual. And so as a creator, he is creating things far more than I can comprehend, far more vast, and yet it is deeply personal and very individual when you think of him as our God, as our Redeemer in that regard. That also means that when it comes to the creation of this earth, that this earth was not an experiment. This earth, earth was not something new in the creation process. That Heavenly Father and Christ knew exactly what they were doing and that things were planned out minutely from the beginning. Nothing was left to chance. Yeah, what it means is, is that uh, God, the gods, are not a, a bunch of grand laboratory technicians. Oh my gosh, well, gee, what if this doesn't work or what if this happens? I better run back and check the textbooks because I've never come across this before. No, what it really means is that they have all power to answer our prayers. When, yes. when we pray, we can have perfect confidence that they can answer our prayers. And you think about the comfort that that is to people 
Well, and there again, it's the, it's the infinite with individual, yeah. both. I mean, like I, I remember a missionary companion that would never say his prayers the same time I was saying my prayers because he was afraid God couldn't <laughs> hear them both at the same time. <laughs> and yet when we're dealing with a creator and a redeemer yeah. of infinite and eternal nature, um, I, can, I can rest assured that he, he can not only create worlds innumerable, but he can listen to individual prayers and well, answer well, them. I ask my students to engage in an exercise. This is one of their homework assignments when, when we start talking about this go out on a starry night, look up into the heavens, realize that that Milky Way, which contains millions and millions of stars, is just one small galaxy in millions of galaxies created by the Savior under the direction of the Father, and yet realize that in, in the midst of all of that creative, creative, great creative power, He still cares for you right. and me on an individual basis. And when He makes a promise, he has the power to fulfill. He has That's the right. power, and, and there is absolutely no question we at all can that have perfect confidence. And I think him. that's why this whole concept of God with us, God among us, God made flesh, is far more profound than we've ever really mm -hmm. comprehended. I want to go well, back. Well, the way you explain it, of course it is. I, <laughs> no one explained it to me that way. Before. Uh, I want to go back to what we just read in Moses, and the very first part of that that uh, we picked up on because that's another dimension of his premortal godship that uh, we ought to address too and that is where it says he spoke to Moses face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, when we speak of him as an experienced creator, he's an experienced God. Yeah, he's an experienced right. lawgiver as well. Long before the New Testament comes into play and long before Jesus is teaching the scribes and Pharisees, he's been teaching the Israelites. He's been uh, revealing his mind and will to the prophets. So he's the great and the glory, and absolutely. The glory. So he's the great Jehovah come to earth. Uh, and that's, that's pretty consequential when you think about it. This is the, the nature of the being that came down to this well, earth. Well, and I think we see that particularly in John 8 uh, when we're talking about the seed of Abraham and, he, and, when, and, and Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Or we could change it to before Abraham was, was I, I am, am, and then you cross-reference it back to Exodus chapter 3. It's clear yeah. what Jesus is talking about there as the great Jehovah, the, yeah. the I and am. The, and the reaction of the Jews of the Jews, they him, pick up the stones. They understand. Not because he n says Abraham saw his day. Mm -hmm. He's declaring himself as the great Jehovah. Mm -hmm. With regards to the, the foreordained Redeemer as part of that birthright responsibility of the firstborn in this pre-mortal God, and we speak of the, the promised Messiah, but in reality he is already the Messiah long before he ever takes flesh and bone upon him, uh, that, that I think that we have references in the, in the scriptures that clearly s teach us that the atonement was in operation long before we ever come here. The Book well, of Mormon is particularly rich well, with Well, Alma those. 13 can't be understood any other way, mm -hmm. I don't think. And, and so uh, when we speak of him as the foreordained redeemer, in some ways that short changes the fact that he was already the, the Redeemer. Redeemer. Well, when you say foreordained, I think you're referring to uh, his Messiahship, right. meaning the, on, the anointed one, and that anointing takes place in the preexistence. Exactly. He's already anointed the Messiah in the preexistence. So he is the Mashiach. That's the Hebrew for Messiah. Mm -hmm. He is the Mashiach way before he comes to and this earth as And look how it works with, with Enos in the Book of Mormon, who prays all night and then is forgiven of his sins for because of his in faith, faith in who will not yet be born for many hundred years. he has never yet right. heard That's nor right. seen. And, and we believe that it worked that way in the Old Testament, that the principles of the gospel and faith and redemption came by a future looking forward to that atoning sacrifice. If we believe that, which we do, doesn't it make sense to believe that it worked just the same way in the pre-mortal world? So what you're saying pretty pretty clearly I, I hear is that the atonement was already operative or operating in our pre-mortal existence. Elder Orson Pratt taught it very explicitly. He says we see no impropriety in believing that the Savior's atoning sacrifice was in operation yeah. and efficacious long before we ever come I, I to knew earth. that quote. I just wanted you to <laughs> quote it. <laughs> Revelation chapter 12. How did we, were we victorious in pre-mortality? Right. It's by the by word the blood of our of testimony, but it's the blood of the Lamb. Right. That, that exactly. his atonement was... I think was that's also what the word in Alma 13 is referring to when it speaks of a preparatory redemption. Yeah. And Doctrine and Covenant section 9338 says that when we come to earth, we are made innocent again. again. I think that says an awful lot yeah. right well, there. If it is an infinite uh, atonement, 
and without time, then it applies to all things right. that Heavenly Father has done. Including these from, births that have been created before. Exactly. From, from our birth in the spirit world, whatever that was, until the final uh, rewards that we receive. The, the atonement covered all of that. Well, we always talk about the atonement extending forward. We never talk about it extending backward. I, I suppose we, we could leave off our discussion uh, for this session by saying it is this great Jehovah, this God, who came to earth in the meridian of time on this very earth out of all of the millions that he created and we know him in mortality as Jesus of Nazareth. His mortal life opened to us an eternity's worth of possibilities for which we're all grateful. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.